had some internet trouble this morning. Okay, now we're going. That's not what. So uh, welcome. It's uh, Thursday, the 16th of September, 2021. Yay. And this course is Sociology of Popular Culture 302086, Group 1, or 1. Uh, all right, so I'm going to be presenting a kind of a introduction lecture and um, then work through the course guide with you after the break, I guess. Uh, maybe look at some text as well. Um, we all surely know what popular culture is, right? Let's try and challenge that anyway. Do you know who this old bald man sitting on the beach in the picture is? Anyone? No. Oh, well. Sad but true. This guy you'll get to know now is Theodore Wiesengrund Adorno. Theodore Adorno uh, from the Frankfurt School a German sociologist. Excuse me, we will have occasional interruptions. What could you like? Turn the internet off, please. Yes. Sorry. She always likes to stay, say hello at the start. She she knows not to interrupt. Um, Theodor Wiesengrund Adorno. It was his birthday. I mean, he's dead, right? Dead 60, 69. Uh, his birthday on November, uh, September the 11th. Uh, he was born in uh, 1903 and died in 69. Uh, but he was a German sociologist and um, perhaps I think the number one theorist of um, the culture industry culture as an industry which is key to understanding the sociology of popular culture and i wanted to make this course kind of have his work as central because i think it's well worth knowing for us now what i'm going to go through here is the course plan and guides um, talk about groups and presentations not groups for presentations but um, talk about how we will organize uh, online reading uh, and, and group work or, uh, or, or research work. I have something new to try with this one. Some of you will be familiar from the critical thinking course of the zine scene stuff, but with a variation, of course. Um, and I'm going to introduce you to the e-learning materials and where the reading is and, and all that stuff. So we have the course number and there's my email for you to get in touch with me. J-O-H-N-H-U-T-N-Y-K at tdtu.edu.vn. You, of course, already had courses with me before, so you have that address probably in your uh, automatic thing. All right, so that's all the detail. I welcome you to the course, and uh, I can talk about the course objectives. Objectives, what we hope to do. What I hope to do is help you read your way into popular culture studies. Different from culture studies, different from sociology, popular culture studies is almost its own discipline. It has its own key readings and It does overlap significantly with other areas of work. So musicology, um, film studies, uh, festival studies. There are, so maybe these would be sub-branches of popular culture studies. Um, but the key texts that revolve around these, and, and it overlaps a lot with social theory and even some philosophy. And each person will map the area a bit differently. So consider this. What I'm trying to help 
you do is, is to encourage your enthusiasm for reading the texts and concepts and perspectives in this broad field. Approaches to critical theory research. When people say critical theory, they, they largely, whether they know it or not, referring to Adorno and the Frankfurt School. And then their analysis of mass culture or their economic and cultural analysis of popular culture themes. Now, how I imagine this is a bit complicated. So on the surface, it's a series of music video and film examples, screenings, and, and talk about them. And uh, I kind of want to say updating Adorno for post-colonial, so-called, so-called post-colonial times. Right? Adorno died in 69, so he knew nothing really of uh, what happened after the 60s, late 60s. I mean, he was there for the late 60s, but, but not really able to write anything much about that. The 70s, the cultural movement since, and the globalization of certain mass culture forms, whether it be uh, European or American forms or their um, different Asian phenomena, have you from Korea or, or what have you, and uh, had no idea of file sharing or internet or um, um, MP3s, or even, even MTV, something like that, which now has kind of disappeared, but, but uh, I mean, still exists, but it's not as significant as it was. All those things, or heavy metal, punk rock, disco, um, hip hop. Imagine a world in which hip hop had not yet happened. Um, drum and bass, jungle, electronica, dance music. I mean, this is just in music, let alone the phenomenon of um, mass television streaming and uh, 52 channel, 520 channels, still nothing to watch. Anyway, I want to uh, take the work of Adorno and try and drag him into the 21st century. That's a bit ambitious, but still. Reinventing and reanimating with new energy, multidisciplinary, um, using primary global resources. Thinking about the international framework, the critical encounter with the cultural industries. Stressing sometimes the audio of audiovisual, because some people don't do that. Uh, and the social or social political, the political in mass culture should be a topic. And I'm proposing that we'll do this course as a uh, close, devoted to close readings of Adorno's works on art, music, culture industry, more widely conceived. I mean, Adorno wrote a book in 1947 with Max Horkheimer called the culture industry. And people took that as a definitive statement. But he then worked for another 20 years on the same, uh, rethinking the same uh, area of work and really developing his, his essay. So if you read something like the culture industry reconsidered, you see his positions are very different. Adorno changes. So, so even people who refer to Adorno with approval sometimes get him quite wrong. It's interesting. But a lot of people don't. Adorno has a kind of, uh, there's a backlash or a critique of uh, a reaction to Adorno. People find it a bit difficult. I think because he is sometimes difficult, but sometimes too easy. Anyway, we're going to read some of the texts of Adorno in the class. English, German, or, or even Vietnamese, some are translated. Um, translations are a bit flawed sometimes, but they're useful. Uh, if you're not following uh, closely my accent or talk, 
you can also use translation, right? You turn on your Google Translate with microphone because we're online. It does a pretty good job, not always accurate, but uh, maybe I'll show when, in, when I'm not using the PowerPoint, I can put my translation uh, machine on as well. There are other thinkers I want to read with you. Uh, the works of Gayatri Chakraborty Spivak, some things on popular culture, and the American theorist, uh, sociologist Thorsten Veblen, who really was writing 100 years ago or more but who got ignored ever since, pretty much. But his theory of the leisure class, an economic study of institutions, is really a key piece of work. Uh, in the critical thinking course, we looked a little bit at uh, his work on, on, on um, education. So I'm, I'm keen to get in. Here's a picture of him, actually. Hang on a sec. I got a new biography of his. See if I can get this on the camera squarely. He looks like a nice bloke, right? So there's this new big fat biography of him. 480 pages, nearly finished. Um, so his, his work, Theory of the Leisure Class, is uh, 1899, so 122 years ago, was one of the early studies of um, leisure, right, by a sociologist. Uh, unusual topic in those days because there was always economy and work and labor to think that the consumption of pleasure uh, goods, of, of, so that was just sort of too trivial to be the interest of sociologists. Although there was another um, important scholar wrote on the leisure industry, where is it? Yeah, this one. A Soviet scholar, a Bolshevik revolutionary from Russia after the revolution, actually writing um, before the, the, the revolution took place in 14, 1914, so three years before. Nikolai Bakunin. Bukharin, sorry, Bukharin. Nikolai Bukharin was a member of the um, Bolshevik Party, Russian Revolutionary Party, and he wrote the economic theory of the leisure class in 1914, which is uh, pretty amazing to see that um, the Russian revolutionaries were writing about this. He doesn't refer to Veblen, though, and um, it's an old text, but. Bukharin, uh, of course, was was executed in the 1930s um, show trials under Stalin. So um, while he was a member of the Bolshevik Party and a revolutionary, he then was persecuted and 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 uh, denounced as being a Trotskyite or, or linked to the uh, opposition. And in fact, he ended. He did make a confession, um, although I think uh, like a forced confession. Anyway, we don't need to get into that sort of detail so much. But this question of the of the leisure, the, the, the consumption side of capital has a long history. Marx too, of course, talked about consumption. You should think about that. Uh, but in terms of the reproduction of labor work, of labor power, you had to consume to be able to go to work. So you had to have time off to be able to re-energize. Another part of the course running largely parallel to the reading and looking at the videos from films and, and music uh, that I want to do is, is new for this version of the course. So I've taught this course many times, uh, but, and, and now four times already at TDT. But this will be the first one where I've changed things up a bit. We're going to make the assessment a kind of case study of some institutions of culture. All right, so working in groups or in pairs, I think pairs, probably, pairs or, or at best groups of three. Um, I want to develop critiques of cultural institutions using the Frankfurt 
school work and subaltern studies work um, to allow you to to bring in examples from Vietnam or Southeast Asia or East Asian popular culture but also to get to know what is going on in the city even if we can't actually physically visit them because we're in COVID we can look at their uh, websites and so on to look at the institutions that are promoting culture I don't mean just um, the Ministry of Culture, right? Based there in uh, Rue Katanat, in um, the old police headquarters. Uh, but I, I think I'm thinking of, of other cultural institutions that are promoting uh, culture in this city. So I've been talking in over the summer, uh, preparing this, I've been talking with people from the Goethe Institute which is the German uh, cultural promotion institute here in, in Ho Chi Minh City, and thinking about Alliance Francaise and others, but speaking mostly with, with the Goethe Institute to have them um, involve us as a class or, or for them not to be surprised that we get ourselves invited in to see what they are doing uh, and 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 make a case study there will be a kind of sociological audit of their their work so if you've done a previous course with me that did zine stuff in a way we'll be making a, a zine slash report a, a, a diy consumers report on a culture industry institution and putting that together and the midterm will be a plan for that then the final will be that uh, instead of an essay that's my plan anyway um, we will discuss it a lot in the time coming up over the next next over the weeks uh that we have together 15 weeks i've, I've allocated the last few weeks to preparing that work. In the meantime, we will look at some pretty standard cultural fare, some music, some film, some documentary, and um, yeah, I think that's the course content stuff. Let me see what else. Uh, of course, when I write a Nowadays, when you write a, a, a course outline in a university, they ask you to put course learning outcomes. And I've said this in other courses, it's becoming a bit routine. How do you know what the outcome can be when you haven't done the course yet? And I don't, I, I, I kind of know what I'm trying to do, but what will actually happen, I can't say. But let's try and hope that we can have these outcomes that we get to know and understand mass popular culture, critique of culture and interpretation through the lens of the Frankfurt School and Adorno and so on. Popular culture theorists like Adorno. That we then became better at, or at least able to make interpretations of popular culture, examine ways in which popular culture infects, shapes our knowledge, experience, our outlook on life to connect cultural events to research questions, to know how to examine context and historical shifts and patterns that, and apply critical theory. So, you know, there are some people who will say you can't simply apply critical theory. It's not like paint, painting on a wall. You can't apply it like, but it's a perspective, a critical perspective on research and it's certainly not one like marketing okay adorno is someone who's who's inspiring to me because he's very negative he even has a book called negative dialectic and a lot of people are put off by that but i think it's something we should embrace uh, mark fisher is a, a friend of mine who died a couple of years ago took his own life but he used to say that there should be more negativity in life because that's what inspires movement. And I'm, 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 I'm kind of wanting to encourage that. 
to be negative about things, but to be critical of everything. Marx also said the same thing. For a ruthless criticism of everything that exists. It's a famous quote of Pac-Man. So here are the topics. First page, an introduction and a welcome. Welcome. And that's what we're doing right now. Um, and I'm going to talk more about Adorno and, and talk about the readings and, and so on. It might not take us till all the time that we have today because it's introductory, but yeah. In next week, I want to talk about the context, what I'm calling the colonial foundations of pop culture. What I want to do is look at the, the, the British band. Some say the greatest pop band there ever was, you know, the Beatles. But to be negative about them, in a way, to explore and anyway, anyway, the interesting colonial connections that go through their work, all the way through their work, I mean, and the context in which that, that happened, all right, their interest in India. Um, because of my research interests, you'll find a lot of the connections I make in popular culture will go to India. Slowly, I want to change that to be Vietnam, but the area of culture that I know over visiting every year since 1987 uh, is India. I go there, except for last year because of COVID, I've been there every year. So, and, and some years I spent like eight months there, some only a couple of weeks, but that's where many of my examples come from. The other one is England because I live there. And, and sometimes from Australia, because that's where I'm from. A little bit Turkey, sometimes Japan. I've worked there as well. Taiwan, not so much. But um, we're going to focus a lot. You're, you're, you might raise the question why I keep on using Indian examples and why not Vietnamese, but I, I would like you to bring the Vietnamese examples. I mean, there are some great films, but I'm not... Um, First of all, fluent enough in the language, still uh, Annabelle is better at speaking than me, still about 50% only in Tibet. Annabelle Loirato Tibet is very good, but I'm not. So I can't really then talk confidently about Vietnamese films, whereas Bengali, I can speak Bengali and I can talk badly, but uh, I can talk about Indian cinema, although that's in many languages, of course. The dominant grouping of languages will be Hindi there, but there's also a, a, a new wave Bengali cinema filmmakers like uh, Mrinal Sen and uh, Ritwik Gatak, and of course Shatujit Roy. Yeah, they're all important. But anyway, we're starting starting off. I want to look at uh, the West's consumption of India and its colonial framing. Then I'm going to look at, in, in Chapter 3, some uh, material on festivals and films about um, Mela, festivals in India, that I think you'll find interesting. That, and it, it manages to, uh, I think we can do a history of film in South Asia by looking at uh, these films. I want to, uh, in Week 4, introduce the idea of institutional theory. So this is where we start to talk about what the final research project will be, but to talk about what a sociology of the institution of pop culture, of popular culture, of mass culture would be. Um, I've worked out that lecture, but right now I'm not remembering what the content is, but it's to do with Veblen's work and we'll be reading some Veblen for that. Boston Beblen. Chapter five or lecture five is cinematic revisionism about history in contemporary films. So the way in which a film about a historical event in India from 70 years ago is now being changed because of the political circumstances of a thing called diaspora. Is diaspora a concept that you come across in sociology yet? Anyone? Diaspora. 
Let me write that in the chat so you know exactly what I mean by that word. Have you used the concept of diaspora? You can use your voice to res respond though. So anyone? Han? Camera went off. Anne? Ji Wong? Anyone? Diaspora. Yes. Sorry. Typo. Yes. Anyone want to risk offering a definition? What do you mean? What do we mean by diaspora or diasporic? Forms and no. No, anyone? Hmm. I thought in sociology this was becoming really a big topic. Okay. All right, I make a note that I have to talk about diaspora a bit. I mean, I can do it now, but I should think about it a little bit. Um, diaspora. So I want to write down. Jung, yes. Okay. Migration is a dispersed population originating in a particular locality. Historically, the word diaspora was used to refer to the mass dispersal that forced the inhabitants to leave their native territories, especially the Jewish immigration. That's a, a definition grab from the internet or something right it's a bit old that version but it's correct yeah yeah um it's keen for people to to say that right rather than than look it up um nowadays we talk about diaspora without the forced dispersal although the, the dispersal of people might be forced in a way, diaspora refers to just the existence of people who have two homes, two cultural homes, right? Dia, two. Dia means two divided or divide in two, di, dia, um, Greek, right? And spore means, spore is like a seed that goes from the tree and lands somewhere else and grows again. So in this sense, it means from two origins, diaspora. So the diaspora of, um, we can talk about the Indian diaspora or the Pakistani diaspora or the Vietnamese diaspora. Um, I forget this, the word for Vietnamese diaspora uh, for people in, in Nui Kiel. Am I right? I think I've got the pronunciation wrong. Me too? No. Hmm. My translation doesn't give me anything for diaspora. What about diasporic? Nothing. Hang on. Hmm. 
Huh. Unknown word. I'm spelling it wrong. I'm trying to translate it. Uh, Q. No. It's something like this. Help me out. Anyone? Hit Q. That's correct. Thank you for. How do you spell it? I always put a H in there. Hit Q. And that translates in English to uh, overseas Vietnamese. That's how the English translation is. But that will be the diaspora. But in Vietnam, maybe it's slightly different because there's a connotation that the Viet Q left because of the end of uh, the fall of the southern South Vietnamese regime but there are many examples like the jewish diaspora didn't really aren't just those who left germany they are spread and have no necessary home and the african diaspora will be everyone the south asian diaspora came to england in different times so there's many that origin story about immigration isn't the defining characteristic what really is defining about diaspora is that you have two places that you can kind of call home the place that you are culturally from your your or, or your parents home culture or Viet Q that would be Vietnam and the place that you're now in so California or Australia or Germany or Czechoslovakia or where or for South Asians it's um, Silet in, in, in Bangladesh and Birmingham. And both places are somehow home. And some people talk about clash of cultures and, and some talk about um, double consciousness or for the American, African-American, right? Or hyphenated identities. People talk about that. African-American, British, Asian. You know, British Asian actually means South Asian. Doesn't mean someone from Vietnam living in Viet, in Britain, uh, because Asian for the British refers to India, whereas Asian for Australians referred to China and Southeast Asia. And Asians in for for the Turkish refers to the Middle East. Uh, the, the reference are, are moving, but the idea is that you have two places you call home and that there is more importantly a cultural project attached to that your cultural performance your creation of a popular culture owes both to the original home country and a kind of translation into the new home so british asian dance music is a book that i did in um 25 years ago now was about new Asian dance music, diasporic music, made by South Asians in Britain. So it was electronic, but it had the sounds of, a kind of interpretation of the sounds of South Asia, of sitar and bangra rhythms. I can't interrupt me now. Fia, write me a note if you need to. Your school should start now. Sorry, my son. Um, diaspora in 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 um, some studies, like by anthropologists, is is they talk about the second generation, but I have problems with that because the second generation is never just the second generation because people come in England anyway. Over four hundred years, there's been Asians coming to to Britain, so it's not second generation; it's twentieth generation as well. Although the big migration of South Asians into um, England happened in the 70s, though not from India, from Kenya. So they had already migrated once to Kenya and then got kicked out by Idi Amin and then went to, in the 70s, to, to England. 
anyway diaspora is one of the institutions and and uh, it's also um, being revised uh, you're used in revisionist history because um, some battles at home in the home country like hindu versus muslim in india are being played out again in the new country in england diasporic politics can be bound up Um, okay, I spent a couple of weeks looking at this diasporic concept or diasporic involvement in popular culture. First, the South Asian music, because I did research on that for a long time, um, and then updated that research around uh, the last 20 years of the war on terror, Afghanistan and, and, and so on. I mean, it started out as the war on terror, it became the defeat of well, can we call it a defeat? The Americans have left Afghanistan, but um, it seems that they weren't there to win anyway. They were there just to be engaged in military contract. Anyway, we can talk about all that when we come up to it. After chapter eight, after the break, because there's a... Um, we miss a day, actually. We miss. We have no class because of a holiday on the 7th of October. And then we have midterm break on the uh, first week of November. I think that's when mid midterm is. So I think we would have actually midterm between Chapter 6 and 7. But after what I thought would be after the, the break, so week 8 and 9, we really focus on Adorno. And especially his book, Current of Music which uh, I make available on the e-learning in complete uh, form, but also chapter by chapter, we'll read several of the chapters of Current of Music. And uh, that stuff is, is uh, Adorno's text is, is accessible, um, partly because he wrote it in English, not German, although maybe his thinking is still quite Germanic, but the sentences are, uh, uh, less German, I think, in some sense. Anyway, it was never really published as a book. It was assembled afterwards. But it still is an important piece of work. So we spent a couple of weeks on that. Chapter 8, Chapter 9, and where are we? The next page, Chapter 10, commercialization. And then, so they're really focused on an Adorno, and we'll be thinking about our research projects. But then I want to go back specifically to start to, to plan out the engagement with institutions of culture like the Goethe Institute and um, whichever else we can find. And we'll, we'll break up into teams of two or three and uh, we'll do searches, internet, and if we can in real life, it's possible, but I think we're likely to stay online for most of this course. And um, do, as I say, what, I, what I'm calling an institutional audit we will set ourselves up as a kind of um, team to investigate the cultural production of these institutions that's the idea as a kind of project for generating a text i then have a lecture that i want to give on uh, or a study i want to do of uh, adorno talking about vietnam uh, protest media because, I mean, not just about Adorno and Vietnam, but he does have, there's a little film, and um, he does comment about that. Uh, then, back to institutions again, because we're working on this for the final. Uh, a big part of Adorno's work is on education, and so we spend some time looking at that because we're in education, and it's worth examining and important. Um, I put it towards the end and after protest media and, and Vietnam because Adorno wrote on education after World War II and in order to try and say, look, the war is over, the Nazis have been defeated, but we can't just say never again and the Nazis will never happen because Europe hasn't dealt with the fact that there were Nazis and that Nazi, the, the fascist mentality 
wasn't defeated completely. It still existed, and not only in the Germans. There were fascists in England as well. There's fascists in the institutions. So it's interesting to look at his work in those terms. Then, of course, we have a revision and a final thing. And I hope there will be uh, people presenting their work uh, at this stage as well. Okay. So that's the week by week. If you have any questions, now's a good time for them. All okay? So far, so good? So far, so good? So far, so good? In um, French, Arabic, diasporic culture, there's a fantastic film um, called La Haine. We should watch some of that, The Hate. And La Haine starts off with a fantastic sequence. A guy jumps out of a building and he's falling. And as he's falling, people in the different floors of the building hear him say, so far, so good, so far, so good. So far, so good. The thing is, the falling is not bad. It's the landing that really sets the scene. Interesting premise for the beginning of a film. La Haine. Let me see if I can find that. Now, an interesting thing about La Haine is that uh, the Asian band, um, uh, fun, uh, Asian Dub Foundation, had um, had uh, uh, played the film with a um, you call it a, a, a they played their own soundtrack to it. So they took off the film's soundtrack, which actually was quite a good soundtrack, and they uh, recorded or played live a concert over the top. And that made the film much more, um, um, what do we say, popular. i see if I can get this to work so that we'll watch it in, um, I just want to see if, if showing a film works. So well, here it is, but I really need to turn off my microphone. Otherwise we get a double C'est l'histoire d'un homme qui tombe d'un immeuble de 50 étages. Le mec, au fur et à mesure de sa chute, il se répète sans cesse pour se rassurer. Jusqu'ici, tout va bien. Jusqu'ici, tout va bien. Jusqu'ici, tout va bien. Mais l'important, c'est pas la chute. C'est l'atterrissage. Il y a deux jours, il avait sévèrement blessé un jeune de la cité pendant une garde à vue. Il est mortel en vérité, putain. Et alors, qu'est-ce que tu vas en faire Vas-y, on verra s'il y a des lumières. Sorry, I turned my mic off so they could watch. 
Um, so, so yeah, that's uh, great to see. The film has been restored. Uh, it's called La Haine, The Hate. I recommend it. Um, you can see it. You can get a, a easy to to get a um, a torrent of of that. If you don't know what a torrent is, you need to email me and I will teach you how to get torrents. But everyone knows that now, right? Um, yeah. Where are we up to? I'm asking about questions. Yeah, anyone have any question yet? Mm-hmm. So I'd love to organize a screening of La Haine. I'm not sure if I have a copy and whether or not there's time to watch all the things that I want to watch. But La Haine is amazing for, for um, the way in which popular culture theory of the time was referenced in the film. The film is by Michael Kasowitz, right? And he was obviously reading cultural theory of the time. Because, I mean, the, 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 the film study stuff is, what do you need to make a film? Is a famous quote from, from Jean-Luc Godard, the 60s filmmaker. He said, all you need to make a good film in France is a girl and a gun. And they got the girl and they got the gun in that film. Um, there's a sequence in the in the film where uh, Vince is in front of the camera, standing at the camera very aggressively, in your face, confrontational MTV style filmmaking, right? Uh, front on. That was unseen before the 90s, that kind of aggressive film. And he's going uh, with the gun in his hand, uh, make sort of quoting from the De Niro film Taxi Driver. So a French Arab migrant living in Paris is quoting a classic line from a Hollywood street movie. Taxi Driver is the one with Jodie Foster and, and Robert De Niro. Uh, and being a, like a gangster, a French youth pretending to be a gangster in uh, Paris. Then the scene where uh, the boys have gone into the center of Paris and they go to an art gallery and it's all like the joke of the bourgeois art scene. Uh, but then when they escape from that, they're in a shopping mall confronted by this wall of, of screens, public TV screens showing the news about their friend who's died in, in police custody. And um, yeah, that, that, that phenomenon of the wall of TV screens, which is now a very common thing in our popular culture that there be public screens uh, was referenced in the film too. It's so interesting. But then so many films refer to films referring to films that, that that's part of the, the pop culture in any case. Okay. What to do next? Uh, next I'll go back to the PowerPoint, I suppose. So this is where I was at before. And um, said all that. I guess we look at the um, setup of the assessment. There will be 30% to process as usual. It means your participation, basically it means having your camera on during these sessions. Uh, that will be attendance and um, doing some of the exercises that I'll set, some homework exercises, not many, not as many as I've done in other classes, and something about presentation towards the end of the research project. Midterm, it says essay, but I mean an essay plan, right? For 20%, it's not gonna be much work. Um, and, and that'll be, yeah, mid midterm, making a plan of action for like a detailed plan of action for the research and then the report will be the report um, of the research which you'll do in teams of two pairs which you can choose or, or at most three okay no more than never more than three uh, but two or three okay um, and like you know we're talking about less than 10 pages uh, in a newspaper zine like report, a report basically, 
like more like a report that uh, that it would be an environmental audit or a institutional audit. So it wouldn't be like structured like an essay. It will be a bit like an essay. Anyway, we're going to talk a lot about that. Um, so that's the assessment, right? Here's where I talk about this. Uh, new for this year to introduce a form of engagement with popular culture that is developing into a new style of doing research work and coursework, a study evaluation zine. You know about zine culture or good? You've done it before with me. Um, but it's not so much a zine as an as institutional report. But you can find zine resources there. Uh, the core reading is Adorno's Current of Music, um, but there's some other recommended texts I'm going to suggest. And um, I don't know, Mackenzie Walk, I'm, I'm thinking twice about that now. Disorienting Rhythms, that book there, the middle, the second one, second, first recommended text, that's now 25 years old, but that's the, the book in which we talked about the politics and new Asian dance work music. I was one of the editors and wrote two of the chapters. Um, we're going to look at specifically at one of those chapters in a, in a, a session. Uh, so I want you to prepare material for that when we come to it. Um, all right, it's been an hour. I think we need to take a break uh, because I don't want the videos that I'm making, which will be available to watch uh, too long. Um, let me say, stop presenting. Notice not many people have got their camera on. So when I do this to check uh, attendance, there's a lot of people that are not showing. Oh, you're coming back now. All right, so what I'm suggesting is we have a break now for a few minutes so we can get a cup of tea and whatever. Since we're all at home, right, you can have a snack or something. Um, don't have to walk all the way across the street to get food. And come back in seven minutes. So at 10 minutes to two, okay? And uh, then I'm going to go through um, the lecture part and some of the reading. Yeah, I think. So, yeah, seven minutes. Thank you very much. See you. Uh, and you can ask questions in the meantime on the chat or be ready with your questions to ask when we come back. Let me stop the recording. Should have done that already. Some people are.